Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon or good evening to all of you from all around the, the globe. Thank you for bearing with us during some connection issues. My name is Maeve Nivwinon and I'm an obstetrician gynaecologist in the Institute of Obstetrics and Gynaecology at the Royal College of Physicians in Ireland. We have a very nice programme today um, once we can get our connectivity issues uh, sorted and we're going to change the order of the first session to go straight to um, Mr Eric O'Flynn from the Royal College of Surgeons um, in Ireland. We will be followed then um, hopefully by our COSEXA colleagues to hear about the provider and regional leadership experience and then by our Trinity colleagues to, to speak about sustaining partnerships. Today's theme is education for equitable health. And so it's very um, focused that this first session is, is on um, global education partnerships between different regions. I would like to tell you a little bit now about Mr. Eric O'Flynn from the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. Eric is the Programme Director for Education, Training and Advocacy in the Institute of Global Surgery in the RCSI. He comes from an education background and has worked on a range, range of education programmes in Ireland, in Africa and in Asia. He has been leading global surgery education programmes in the RCSI since 2011, and he has worked in collaboration with partner organisations, expanding and improving training for surgeons and other providers in the surgical workforce. The projects under his portfolio include capacity building, e-learning, operation theatre processes, simulation innovation, and of course, the big one at this time, data science, to target surgical scale up in the low resource settings. He leads the teaching of global surgery in the RCSI, and he publishes in the areas that he is, is working and supports young researchers as they step into global surgery. I'd like to hand over now to Mr. Eric O'Flynn. Now, thank you very much, Maeve, for uh, the introduction and, and thank you to the, um, the College of Physicians for, for hosting this. Delighted to be here and hopefully uh, everybody um, has borne with us, as you say, through the technical difficulties. And hopefully I'll be able to share my screen um, also. So uh, as Maeve said, I am uh, Eric O'Flynn from the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. Um, my talk, I hope, uh, you'll be able to take in conjunction with the talk of um, uh, of Dr. Jane Folal, who'll be uh, hopefully speaking after me. Jane is going to talk uh, a lot about the College of Surgeons of East Central and Southern Africa, COSEXA, and um, about how international partners, including um, RCSI, uh, have been supporting the growth of that college, which is really um, has been fantastic to see. I'm going to talk about one particular aspect. So you're going to get the, the detail first and then the big picture uh, a little later. I'm going to talk about um, a consortium approach to supporting local partners in surgical care in sub-Saharan Africa. For background, the RCSI Sexa collaboration program has been running for 15 years now, um, generously supported by Irish Aid. It's a capacity building approach uh, to build the capacity of the local surgical training college, uh, leveraging RCSI resources. Uh, it's really worked across um, all the different aspects of, of COSEX's work, um, expanding and enhancing training, examinations, information management, IT, e-learning, um, data capture, uh, building the institutional capacity of recruitment, training of staff, um, and indeed uh, increasingly research, setting up um, uh, institutional review boards, um, boosting their the journal of the, the college. So a wide range of activities, which I really won't get into in, uh, in any great detail here, uh, so I'm just gonna focus on one particular aspect. COSEXA, as you'll hear from um, Dr. Falal, has been extremely successful in, in the last few years. Um, when RCSI began working with COSEXA in 2000 and, um, 2007, 2008, there were uh, approximately a dozen surgical trainees. Now there are just under a thousand uh, with 135 accredited training hospitals. So this is a huge expansion of the surgical workforce in the region. And that's, that's fantastic. This is across 14 countries, I should say, in East, Central and Southern Africa. That's great, but surgical care is a team sport um, and really we're only boosting one position 
in the team, um, so to speak. So the the numbers of um, anesthesiologists, of, of uh, perioperative nurses, um, obstetricians and gynecologists have not increased um, at the same level. So that's really a problem that has been facing uh, COSEXA and or CSI to truly expand surgical care, we have to look across multiple cadres. And, and there's been a long agreement, uh, a long understanding, I suppose, between RCSI, COSEXA, and indeed Irish Aid as funders that something has to be done uh, to support those other cadres in order to deliver the safe surgical care that the people of East Central and Southern Africa need. So the RCSI COSEXA collaboration, um, as its name suggests, is exactly that collaboration between two institutes since 2007. However, over in the in, in recent years, um, this collaboration is really becoming more multidisciplinary and involving a, a number of other institutions. Canexa, the College of Anesthesiology of the same region, um, and the College of Anesthesiologists of Ireland, uh, came on board in, in 2009. And then more recently, um, the East Central Southern African College of Nursing and the uh, College of Obstetrics and Gynecology came on board as well, um, supported by the, the respective um, organizations in, in Ireland, the RCSI Faculty of Nursing Midwifery and the Institute of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in RCPI. So it's really uh, becoming much more multi multidisciplinary. Um, and this is it's this change that I, I'd really like to focus on over the next few minutes. What, what does this mean in practice? Well, most of the activities are still uh, related to a single cadre and uh, surgical training is still the largest part of the work. However, there are an increasing number of activities that are inclusive of multiple different cadres at the same time. There's work that is being co-produced by multiple, uh, multiple partners and multiple different cadres. And probably most uh, importantly, um, we found that so much of the work that has previously been done uh, in surgical training is actually replicable, but not a huge amount of extra work for other cadres. And we'll look at some examples of that. First of all, um, activities inclusive of multiple cadres. Uh, training of trainers and training of, of master trainers um, has been taking place with RCSI um, and COSEXA in Sub-Saharan Africa for many, many years. This is relatively generic training about how to deliver clinical teaching, uh, uh, bedside teaching, lecture, uh, how to give feedback, general pedagogical skills. That's uh, appropriate for um, all uh, postgraduate training, not just for, for surgery. And so in recent years, um, anesthesiologists, um, obstetrician gynecologists, and nurses have been invited to join these trainers, these uh, training courses as well. And indeed, recently, um, all those different cadres have been collaborating to deliver these courses. A couple of weeks ago, an anesthesiology uh, train the trainer um, workshop was held, jointly delivered by COSEX at the Surgical College and CANEX at the Anesthesiology College. Some work is being co-produced by multiple different cadres and institutions. For example, the RCSI Institute of Global Surgery, and Faculty of Nursing Midwifery are working together with the College of Nursing in East Central Southern Africa uh, um, to produce this um, uh, perioperative nursing e-learning program, which launched a couple of months ago. But by far the, the greatest benefit I would see of this multidisciplinary approach is the ability to replicate or to take inspiration from previous work. The, uh, the learning needs of the different cadres are sometimes aligned, but the institutional needs of the, of the, the different training programs are, are very, very similar. For example, to be able to host and administer an e-learning platform. So on the top, you'll see a, the, the COSEXA e-learning platform, which has been in existence since about 2010, and the much more recent CANEXA e-learning platform. You'll see an awful lot of similarities in the, in the screenshot. Similarity on the left, the, the COSEXA uh, current strategic plan. On the right, the CANEXA strategic plan. Um, the work that uh, uh, RCSI has been able to do to facilitate um, the, the, the drafting of the COSEXA plan has been able to lead into um, the College of Anesthesiologists of Ireland and RCSI facilitating CANEXA's 
strategic plan. Very similar journal titles and very similar images. Uh, we conducted a large um, study analyzing the workforce in East Central Southern Africa uh, of, of surgeons, and more recently of anesthesiologists. And next year, uh, we'll be looking at obstetrician gynecologists as well. And similarly, we have experience of building interactive maps to show where uh, where the workforce exactly is, um, and we've been able to transfer that over as well. These are just three examples. I could give you many, many more. Um, really, a lot of the work is very, very replicable. Initially, for um, bringing it from the surgical world to the anesthesiology world, and as we go forward more and more to obstetrician gynecologists and also perioperative nurses. Some advantages of this, well, uh, it's it's a direct response to the problem. It's a multifaceted response to the multifactorial problem. As I hope I've been able to demonstrate, there's efficiencies, um, efficiencies of effort and funding. It doesn't. It's not twice as much effort to do it twice. It's a little bit more. It's also been able to. Um, offer high-income country institutions, Irish institutions, uh, a stepping stone to maybe greater involvement in, in global health activities. And perhaps most importantly, it's, uh, it has enabled and promoted South-South cooperation. The training colleges are often cooperating among themselves without uh, necessarily having an Irish institution involved at all, which is really important. There are plenty of challenges here though as well. Moving from two institutions to eight institutions uh, greatly increases the complexity um, of management of the, the program. There's a lot more people that need to be consulted uh, in terms of planning, reporting, uh, new governance structures need to be uh, devised. Um, the legal arrangements between all the different institutions need to be formalized uh, and finance um, also needs to be carefully managed uh, another particular difficulty um i suppose the difficulty of all partnerships is around attribution for example we, we know that cosexa has done extremely well over the, the the last decade or so that's indisputable um we believe that the orsi collaboration with cosexa has helped cosexa and we can point to some uh, uh gains and activities and milestones but it is always difficult to tell um, how much one activity contributed to, to a good outcome in a partnership. When you have eight institutions partnering together, who really made the difference can be difficult to say. And as long as all partners are um, you know, in agreement with that and happy with that, then it's not an issue, but it, it can be a potential issue. Finally, again, with eight partners working together, coordination um, requires people to, to move in the same direction, and that uh, limits the independence of various colleges to some degree. There are also limits. I, I do hope that um, uh, representative institutions watching this might consider whether their global health programs could take a more um, multidisciplinary approach, a uh, consortium approach, but it may not be possible in every, uh, in every instance. There, will, there does need to be a lead institution, uh, or at least a lead institution on each uh, on each side in the high income country and low income country side. Funding may not be um, it may not be possible to use funding for other disciplines if it's tied for a particular purpose. And finally, we, we said that surgery is a team sport. Other uh, other specialties maybe a little bit less so. In conclusion. Um, I hope that you'll consider that a multidisciplinary consortium approach can be efficient, cost-effective, and sustainable. It is more work, but it is a great deal uh, more impact, we believe. And I'll leave you with an image of the, the very first class of um, the very first cohort of graduates of the College of Anesthesiology in East Central and Southern Africa. And in the middle on the back row, uh, they're joined by the COSEXA president. I think that's a that's an important image of solidarity. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric, and uh, the RCSI consortium uh, thoughts. We are going to continue on to the third um, talk that is listed in the programme, Sustaining Partnerships in Times of Crisis, Lessons Learned from Sudan and Ireland Health Workforce Portfolio. I have great pleasure in introducing um, the, Dr. Frederic Vallier and Dr. Ayat Abu Ala. Uh, Dr. Vallier is the director of the Centre for Global Health in Trinity College, in Trinity Centre for Global Health. She is the Associate Professor in Psychology, um, having um, studied at McGill and, uh, and uh, is now working in leading the PhD in Global Health Programme at Trinity. Her current research focuses on the application of psychology to global health, with a focus on global mental health, mental health system strengthening and human resources for health. She is concerned with closing the research to practice gap. She uses participatory methods and working in close collaboration with civil society organisations and through multidisciplinary consortiums, linking well into the um, or CSI thoughts we've just heard from, from Eric. Her partners have been in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Asia and in the Middle East. Um, I will also introduce Dr. Ayat at this point, Dr. Ayat Abu Ala. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Dr. Ayat is a specialist in public health medicine and adjunct assistant professor in global health at Trinity College Dublin. She works in the domain of global health, reproductive health, health policy and systems, health workforce and implementation science, um, particularly in post-conflict settings and in low and middle income settings. She is currently based with the University of Birmingham on the Dubai campus and is leading on health policy. She has worked extensively with multiple partners on sustainable development in five WHO uh, regions in the pursuit of global health security, universal health coverage. Today of interest, she has served at the Federal Ministry of Health um, in Sudan as Director of Research and Publication. And in particular, her work has informed the health system and health workforce reform, um, particularly the first health workforce migration management policy in Sudan and has spearheaded the first bilateral agreement between the Federal Ministry of Health in Sudan and Ireland's Health Service Executive. I will hand over now to both Drs. Valliers and uh, Dr. Wyatt. Thanks, Maeve. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? <clears throat> Perfect. Um, so it's a pleasure for me anyway to be here and be able to present um, on our partnership here in the Trinity Centre for Global Health with the Sudanese Medical Specialization Board. Uh, it's been a partnership that we've had for quite a while now, um, all thanks to, I suppose, the, the dedication and um, hard work of my close colleague, uh, Dr. Ayat Awagla. So in the true spirit of partnership, we will be presenting this uh, together today. I uh, know we only have about 12 minutes, so the challenges are as Ayat to try and do this as effectively as possible without having it be too choppy, but I think we'll be okay. So I'm just going to give a brief introduction uh, and set the scene a little bit. Ayat then is going to be talking a little bit about how uh, Ireland and Sudan have engaged in partnerships across a number of different partnerships uh, across both countries. I'll then talk specifically about the ESTA partnership that we have between the Trinity Centre for Global Health and the SMSB. And then we'll have a bit of a reflection around um, what happens when things change very rapidly. So in the case of Sudan uh, in, in 2019, very rapidly changing sociopolitical context and how do we try and sustain these partnerships in times of crisis? So all of that in 12 minutes. Um, so just to set the scene a little bit, um, sorry, I don't appear to have function to change the size. Oh, thanks so much, Maeve. Um, so essentially Sudan is a very big country. Um, it's also bordered by uh, other countries where there's been a lot of um, civil unrest for, in some cases, many years. Um, Sudan hosts a number of refugees and asylum seekers within its borders. Um, and um, I suppose against this, this kind of uh, background, there's also a critical shortage of human resources for health and a skill mix and balance. So Sudan produces a lot of doctors uh, for for the doctors to nurses ratio, many of whom are inequitably distributed 
in uh, Sudan's capital city, Khartoum. So predominantly located in more urban settings, as tends to be the case uh, in most settings worldwide. Um, there's also, I suppose, a weak absorption and, and retention policy. So Ayat will speak a little bit more about some of the agreements that she's helped to broker in terms of trying to um, make less attractive the opportunity for people to leave uh, Sudan in pursuit of medical careers elsewhere to try and retain um, some of the medical uh, staff within the country. Uh, so there's a brain drain problem um, with the push and pull factors largely uh, influenced by uh, countries in the global north. Um, and there's uh, also weak performance measurement, uh, which talks to a little bit of some of the work that I did as part of her PhD in Trinity here as well, but we probably won't have time to get into that. Um, so as part of this, Ayat has been involved in a number of different partnerships, um, and I will hand over to her to describe those here. Thank you, Frederic, and uh, hello, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's a pleasure being with you here today. Um, and yes, as Frederic mentioned, it's quite a challenge summarizing uh, a partnership that has been built indeed uh, over several years and leveraging from um, actually connections and training and education um, back since the 1960s. So the current uh, partnership essence uh, is indeed to collaborate uh, um, to the common challenge that both our countries face. I mean, the health workforce crisis in general, it's a global matter. And as Frederic kindly mentioned, the health workforce landscape in Sudan. So both countries, Sudan and Ireland, through the Federal Ministry of Health and the Health Service Executive, uh, we're both committed to implement the WHO Code of Practice through this umbrella agreement and used it as a framework to guide the training in both countries. Uh, and indeed, in November of 2017, a partnership was signed uh, between both the HSE, the Federal Ministry of Health in Dublin, during the fourth Global Forum of Human Resources for Health. And the partnership mainly aims to build capacity in healthcare, in education, and in training while maximizing the benefits from health workforce mobility and supporting both health systems in both countries. And also improving the quality and safety of healthcare and facilitating effective involvement of the Sudanese medical diaspora in Ireland, uh, which are very strong and big, uh, have big representation and also strengthening the medical nursing midwifery and the light health professions. Well, that was the umbrella agreement that was signed then. Uh, and through that, we developed the Sudan Ireland partnership uh, program uh, that I was leading on. And, and uh, through it and under that umbrella agreement, um, three main programs were set here in Ireland. The first speaks to the first aim of the partnership itself. And uh, Frederic will uh, further elaborate on the partnership between uh, the SMSB and the Trinity Centre for Global Health, Trinity College Dublin, through uh, um, Esther Ireland Partnerships. Um, and the main aim was to enhance the health systems and strengthening. The second partnership was the International Medical Graduate Training Initiative Program. Um, I'm among a, a number of colleagues and hopefully within the audience themselves, you can see a couple of photos reflecting the different work that has been done and the different partnerships. Through this uh, uh, IMGTI, we managed to sign six tripartite agreements and um, 72 fellows to date have indeed enrolled in the program training between Sudan and Ireland. The third program was a uh, diaspora engagement program where uh, we made a better um, benefit of the presence of the Sudanese physicians and health professionals uh, and collaborated through providing better and more diversified um, health and care um, training in Sudan. Over to you, Frederic. So I'll just talk about the first aim, the Esther partnership. So we secured our first Esther grant uh, in 2016 
or 17, can't remember now, feels like ages ago. And really what we uh, were trying to do was in line with the Esther Ames was to foster an international partnership in this case with the with, between the Sudan Medical Specialization Board. So they would be the kind of single um, accrediting body for uh, all medics in the country um, between our institution and their um, organization. So essentially as part of their training, in Sudan, uh, medics have to complete an MD, a medical doctorate. So there's a piece of research that's usually attached to that. And uh, as will become clearer in, when I describe some of the processes that we went through, one of the key things that came out was the MD, the, the research bit is often seen as just something that we need to do and kind of get over and done with in order to get our degree. And the focus is definitely more on the clinical skills than on the research skills. So. One of the needs that was identified by the SMSB was to try and, and strengthen some of that research capacity. But of course, these partnerships are, um, you know, meant to be mutually beneficial. And we, of course, have three different postgraduate training programs here. We have two uh, master's programs and one uh, international doctorate in, in, in global health. And one of the, the one of the things that we were trying to do is actually strengthen our uh, ties in terms of health training and education. So how can this partnership mutually benefit one another so that we can, uh, I suppose, learn from one another and share existing capacity in terms of strengthening research skills for students in, in both contexts, right? So our postgraduate uh, students and then also the, the, the medical um, students in Sudan. Um, and the way that we, we did this is we um, did a series of kind of needs assessments. So the way that we identified this is we actually uh, planned a series of needs assessment workshops in Sudan um, with, uh, I suppose, people that were representing all uh, different disciplines within medicine uh, within the Sudanese Medical Specialization Board. And what we did is we actually established a joint decision to really initiate a formal partnership, right? Because of course, in our first visit, we didn't even know if we wanted to actually establish a partnership. The partnership had to be mutually beneficial. We had to identify kind of key points that we saw as being benefiting of both organizations. Um, also, what we wanted to do is we we wanted to identify was current gaps in both policies and practice. So I mentioned the research, but also we identified gaps in terms of supervision. Um, and supervision for students, which is a gap that we also struggle with as well. Um, and then also trying to look at some skill exchanges between TCD uh, and the SMSB. So we did eventually uh, meet and decided that we wanted to proceed with the partnership, which is great. And we also identified, I suppose, some shared training uh, priority areas. And then we developed a joint training and research agenda, which was then kind of buttressed by a memorandum of understanding. Um, so in the memorandum of understanding, we agreed on the following kind of key objectives for our partnership. One was to improve the quality and accreditation standards for both of our postgraduate education and training programs, trying to improve research in integrity, but also fostering a greater appreciation for research among our postgraduate students. Um, improve the quality of supervision, and here I mean academic supervision rather than clinical supervision uh, for po our postgraduate students, and then also facilitating the exchange of academic and scholarly material. So the lowest hanging fruit in terms of our um, partnership and strengthening and showing proof of, of concept was the third objective. So in our second round of ESTER funding, we'd secured uh, funding to be able to create interactive classrooms uh, for both students uh, here in the Center for Global Health and in the SMSB. So we put in place a communication system, a polycom system, um, and, and to create these interactive uh, classrooms for both of our, our uh, respective students and shared a shared teaching and, and learning curriculum. Um, unfortunately, then, um, this happened and uh, I am in much less of a position to speak to, I suppose, the socio-political context of Sudan than my, than my colleague uh, Ayat here. But I think we wanted to kind of take this opportunity to kind of reflect on what this meant for our partnership. And, and the reality is that um, as a result of the uh, socio-political unrest, a lot of the key members of, of staff within the SMSB that we you know, spent a lot of time and energy identifying needs with, forging the partnership with, forging our MOU with, um, sh shifted. 
Um, and I can talk a little bit more about that. So the question becomes, how do we maintain some of these partnerships when the very people that you've actually built this collaboration with, because as we know, partnerships are built between, you know, individuals and not built between organizations or buildings. Um, how, how do we then uh, try and maintain those when travel is not possible, when people's priorities are shifting, and when the politics and the political priorities within a country are certainly uh, shifting? Um, so I'll hand back over to, to Ayat on this as well. Thank you, Fred. Um, let's see. Yes, indeed, it was a challenge. So uh, in 2018, 2019, the revolution happened in Sudan. Uh, up to date, uh, the country has gone through a turmoil of events um, at uh, all levels, uh, if I may say. Um, the current government that is functioning is functioning on emergency. Um, there's been very high turnover. Uh, within all um, public uh, and private institutions, if I may say, the geopolitical climate has totally changed. Um, the leadership, I mean, from 2018 to date, um, leading on the Sudan Island portfolio and the program with Frederic with the SMSV, I would have a deep brief uh, call with up until now six on the secretaries for the federal ministry of health uh four smsb leadership the president the vice president and secretary general in addition to the different head of councils uh, so it's a true challenge um the unrest in sudan the COVID pandemic uh, um, but we managed, we managed, as Frederic mentioned, um, with, you know, the strong ties and the true uh, sincere partnership and team effort and work that we built throughout the years. Um, some partnerships are less um, effective or, or active, uh, as I, I can say, uh, than others. However, many of the lessons learned is indeed global health diplomacy and definitely by all means uh, improving and effective communication through formal and informal channels. I remember times when I flew from Dublin to Khartoum to reassure uh, uh, the institutions there and back from Khartoum to Dublin and off to Geneva and back and forth just to maintain these ties to reassure people. During the days of the revolution, uh, phones were dead. There was no internet except landlines. So I used to communicate with the different fellows we had within the programs through landlines. But um, what kept it living and what made us succeed, I might say, is indeed uh, demonstrating a win-win approach and uh, um, stressing on the focal points, the different uh, focal points within the different programs um, and their goodwill and taking on board the professional associations and indeed the role of evidence in translating all of this into action. But indeed, it has been uh, a struggle, but with the goodwill of our money partners uh, in Ireland and in Sudan, uh, we succeeded. However, with a lot of hiccups, um, and we're, we're learning, we're learning as we're going. Uh, Frederic, uh, over to you for your additions. Thanks, Ayat. Um, yeah, so I suppose we'll, we'll probably leave it there because I'm aware of time, but um, you know, I think one of the things that at least for us has been incredibly um, helpful is the fact that Ayat and I were very much in an in, in equal partnership approaching this. Um, and Ayat has put an, an awful lot of time and energy um, to kind of sustaining these relationships. Um, and, you know, from the Center for Global Health's perspective, that would not have been possible without a champion, which in this case is definitely Ayat. So the credit goes to you, Ayat, in, in that regard. Um, but having the MOU where we did, you know, go through the process of identifying common needs and agreeing on what we believe were achievable objectives, at least in the short term, um, was very good in terms of anchoring us and bringing us back to, I suppose, the origin of this collaboration and, you know, why we kind of embarked on this on this venture together. So 
that's not to say it wasn't without challenges and including current challenges where Ayat is no longer based in Khartoum. Um, but, you know, we, we are pressing ahead with it and with new management and new people in place within the SMSB. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any questions or if we even have time or space for it, but thanks very much. And we're, of course, Ayat and I are more than happy to answer more questions about the partnership, either offline or online. But thank you. Thank you very much to Frederic and Ayat for raising some very important topics uh, during emergency changes um, as we, we continue in our systems thinking approach uh, to, to global surgical systems. Um, I would like to introduce Dr. Fualao Jane Obubu, Odubu. Um, we believe she's joining us um, again, having had the previous connection issues, and um, she's joining us from Kampala today. Um, Jane, uh, thank you, Dr. Fualal. I see you on screen now. Um, it is my privilege, uh, great privilege, to welcome one of the dominant women in surgery in Africa to this meeting uh, today. Um, Dr. Fualal um, is a breast and endocrine surgeon in Mulego National Referral Hospital, Uganda, the teaching hospital for Makerere University, where she holds her academic post. She has numerous leadership positions and has risen from president of her own association of surgeons in Uganda to vice president for the College of Surgeons of East, Central and Southern Africa region. And I believe they will be meeting shortly. Uh, she um, has developed the breast and endocrine unit at Mulego over her years in the institution, advancing multidisciplinary breast cancer care and also her special interest area of thyroid, thyroid surgery and has brought thyroid surgery and made it accessible um, to many in um, geographically dispersed areas of Uganda. Um, she has been rewarded for her work with the Independence Medal uh, from the President of Uganda, has many other honours. But in particular today, it is great for us to hear when we're talking about um, equitable health care, how a frontline surgical provider can also lead such change over um, a single career. I would like to hand over now to Dr. Fuala. Well, thank you, thank you for that generous to talk about the College of Surgeons of East. So far, have helped us grow, and uh, I'm happy to say that the College of Surgeons of East Central and Southern Africa is now 23 years old. And our first graduation was, uh, our first examination was in 20, 2003 and first graduation 2010. We, we ran in for in the uh, park countries like in West. The surgeons of East, Central and Southern Africa is in 14 countries and it is 23 years old now. And... Um, through the COSEXA RCSI collaboration program, the Royal College of Surgeons of East Central, I mean of Ireland, and the I build a surgical force in the region. This collaboration funded by RCSI has, has grown massively and proved to be feasible. acknowledged by the respective governments of the member countries. With this long-standing funding support, COSEX has presented the following major changes and uh, advantages hinged on our strong collaboration and strong governance and administrative uh, structures. We have established an uh, administrative and operation structure we have had close co collaboration with the member states and the policy making organs. We have uh, forged the pathway of health programs implemented in the different partner states and also accredited trainers and master trainers with all the, uh, the, the, the partner, I mean, the member countries. 
and we have had a significant cohort of trainees in the different surgical fields spread across the region. 88 achieved by the College of Surgeons of East, Central, and Southern Africa, meaning that who qualify 88% are retained within Africa. So improving the health, the human um, resource for health in the different countries. We have a deep rooted training program management by uh, managed by the country representatives, program directors, country coordinators at country level. And um, our students produce high numbers of surgical procedures and patient care has greatly improved. So our partners, our partnership goes a long way with RCSI, and uh, with this we have nurtured partnership with various organizations that provide support in various aspects and have contributed to the growth of the college as well as the positive impact on surgery in the sub-Saharan region. So we have scholarship program partners, and uh, I'm, I'm afraid you're not seeing the screen, but if you, had the, if you had the screen with you, it will show you how many the different partners we, in addition to, to RCSI and um, the Irish Aid, we have the American College of Surgeons who support the women's surgeons. PACS supports all specialties, especially in West Africa. Kidzo Ara supports pediatric surgery. Beige Trust is active in Zambia, Malawi, and Zimbabwe. Smile Train, Operation Smile Research International Second Chance sponsor our plastic surgeons. And we have AO Alliance, which sponsors our orthopedic, surgeon, orthopedic and neurosurgeons, especially the female surgeons in that field. So because of that uh, collaboration and support, this, uh, it has culminated into a very steady rise in trainees. We have uh, of, uh, around 2020 to 2021, we had about 4% rise. But when of late, we have 23% rise, which is this is about four times the original rise in registration of, of trainees. And I'm happy to say that also the female candidates, you know, female all, females always shy away from surgery. But now we are seeing a rise in female uh, um, applicants, and this has risen to 16%, which is very good. This graph shows the exponential rise in the intake of COSEXA and the number of students applying for the training, and it has shown a tremendous rise from only two candidates in 2002, five in 2003, to now 373 in 2022, which is an exponential rise indeed. The female trainees have also, and the enrollment has also increased from 2017 to 2022, in 2017, we only had 18 females applying, but by 2022, we had, uh, in 2022 alone, we had 98 female surgeons, female students applying for the course, which shows a tremendous uh, intake. Now, when we look at uh, training per country, the number of trainees per country also have it markedly improved with Kenya taking the a lead, followed by Zambia, Uganda, and Ethiopia. Kenya's uh, registration pack was, only, was 254, as compared to Zambia, Uganda, and Ethiopia, who had averagely 111 uh, trainees applying. And uh, the, we hope that the rest of the countries will also follow suit. Um, uh, a total of uh, 182 candidates graduated in 2021. And of note is that we had a strategic plan targeting 500 surgeons to be trained by 2020. We were surprised to see that the figure was 557 above our estimate. 
and this represented a 110% achievement. So in uh, 2021 alone, the college regist registered a cumulative number of 630 graduates, hence the increase in the surgical workforce in the region. Um, there's a graph which shows how many surgeons per year are produced, and it also shows that a exponential rise. And also another graph showing the female graduates per year, which has also risen exponentially from a flat graph to a very high level. And um, when we see, like, look at the pie chart, graduates per specialty, we still are lagging behind in fellows in otorhinolaryngology and cardiothoracic surgery, and perhaps uh, fellows in pediatric orthopedics. These are new courses or, that have been introduced, and you know these are super specialities. We hope that um, in the future more, more, peop, more students will apply for this so that the, those subspecialties also increase in number because we need them. There are a lot of patients now, uh, the population is now increasingly having non-communicable diseases, so we need enough a number of cardiothoracic surgeons and pedorthopedic surgeons and also the otorhinolaryngologists. The impact of, of COSEXA in a nutshell is shown in this diagram, which, which I, I hope Mary will give you the slides later. And you see it, it is in a pictorial form. And when you see it, it summarizes whatever I have been saying. So the overall overall impact of COSEX on global surgery is that we have so far tallied down the number of operations and surgical procedures done by our students. So 411,335 411, surgical procedures have been done and so, so that the same number of patients have been treated. This has greatly closed the gap between the patient and the surgeon, and the response to call to healthy lives and promotion of well-being of all ages is, is, the, is, the, aim that, is the aim of COSEXA to make sure that um, we, we produce surgeons who, who are working even in the rural areas so that the, the population receives the surgical services that they deserve. And COSEX has, with the partnerships and collaborations, has contributed immensely to the objective, objectives of universal health coverage, target 3.8, and increased economic activity because of improved healthy lives. So I thank you all for the invitation, and I thank you for listening. I wish you her Merry Christmas, and for those who will travel to Windy Hawk, I hope to meet you there. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fualal. Uh, so I'm afraid today we are unable to take questions and answers due to our late start. But just to, to summarize uh, for the this session here, um, uh, so we started with Eric O'Flynn to discuss the consortium approach to, to partnership between different regions in postgraduate training for surgical services. We then heard about surgical um, or general um, partnerships between Trinity and the Sudanese Medical um, Specialist Board and how conflict and crisis um, and change of institutional leadership requires um, additional champion work and certainty around the mutuality of the partnership. And then from Dr. Fualal, we've heard about how leadership in surgery can certainly accelerate health first health workforce and um, provision as measured by surgical procedures formed, rurality, performed rurality of, of uh, location of work and shows exponential growth in providers and procedures with the um, knock-on effect of improved um, health outcomes with surgically corrected um, disorders. As we wrap up this session, 
the, the takeaway questions for me are how we can join the consortium college approach, postgraduate collegial approach, which has great geographical reach to think upstream uh, into the community for the users of surgical services and to think downstream of what other innovative approaches we can take um, to, to improving health that may not be achieved because of surgical burden, burden of disease. With that, I would like to, to wrap up this session and to guide you to move on to your next uh, session, which will be in the breakout rooms. Uh, the room, room one is aligning global health outcomes in education, and room two is individual to institutional um, establishing partnerships for long term success. Thank you to all our speakers and thank you very much to those who are uh, furiously working away behind the scenes to try and keep this event live.